Hi everybody. In this presentation we're going to be looking at the topic of how materials are moved into or out of cells. The first term that we need to discuss is diffusion. Diffusion is the movement of materials from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. If we look at the illustration here we can see that these green uh, particles are highly concentrated on the left hand side. As they diffuse, they will move to areas where they are less concentrated, which we see over here on the right hand side. Let's take a look at the process of diffusion now using a sim from the PHET project. This is from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Uh, so when I uh, pump the handle here, what we're going to see is a number of gas particles enter into this chamber. Once they enter, you'll see that they're very, very highly concentrated right at that entry point. Because of the random movement of the particles, we'll see them eventually spread out and fill the entire container. So let's watch that process of diffusion in action. So we can see that the particles entered right at this location here, and because of their random movement, they eventually move from an area of high concentration to areas of low concentration low concentration, so they're going to be evenly distributed throughout this entire space. Next is the term osmosis. This refers to the diffusion of water through the cell membrane or through a semi-permeable membrane as shown here in these illustrations. Next we'll take a look at an animation to help us better understand the process of osmosis through a semi-permeable membrane. Here we're looking at a flash animation from St. Olaf College in Northfield, Minnesota. And uh, if we take a look at the process of osmosis, we can see that we have a semi-permeable membrane and on either side uh, the container is filled with water. Now let's watch and see what happens if we set this into motion. We can see that the water molecules are able to move through the semi-permeable membrane, passing back and forth to either side. Now we're going to add some salt to one side. Now the salt particles are too large to pass through the semi-permeable membrane, however the water molecules will move more to this side to try to bring into balance the um, concentrations of water. Keep in mind this is 100% water over here. When we added the salt, this was no longer 100% water on this side, so water molecules will move from left to right to try to raise the percentage of water uh, to the right of the semi-permeable barrier. Now let's discuss how the movement of water by osmosis can change the amount of water inside of cells. Uh, first let's consider when a cell is placed into a hypotonic solution. Now this means that the percentage of water is higher outside of the cell than what it is inside of the cell. Hypotonic means that there's less solute outside of the cell. When cells are placed into hypotonic solutions, because the percentage of water is higher outside of the cell, it will try to move from outside of the cell to inside of the cell, causing the cell to become inflated. Animal cells may burst or rupture in this situation. Uh, plant cells, because of the cell wall, are less likely to burst, however they will become very rigid. Uh, now, let's consider when cells are in hypertonic solutions. This is when there's more solute outside of the cell. This means that the percentage of water is going to be lower outside of the cell. Cells in hypertonic solutions will tend to have water move from inside of the cell to outside of the cell, and this will cause the cell volume to decrease. Finally, isotonic solutions, this is when the percentage of water and the percentage of solutes are the same inside and outside of the cells. Now there is no net movement of water, however there is still water moving out of cells, but at the same time there's water moving into the cells. So the net change for the cells is that there is no net change in the amount of water inside of the cell. Passive transport is when materials are brought into or out of cells without the need for the cell to use any energy. Examples of passive transport include diffusion, osmosis, and facilitated diffusion. My students who are viewing this lecture should draw a picture of facilitated diffusion underneath the passive transport slide. Now, in facilitated diffusion, what we're seeing is that uh, materials can move 
across or through the cell membrane. Extracellular space means outside of the cell. Intracellular space means inside of the cell. So here is the cell membrane, the phospholipid uh, bilayer, and there are sometimes embedded proteins in the cell membrane. These could include channel proteins or carrier proteins. And these uh, proteins will help particles move from areas of high concentration to low concentration. That might mean particles are moving into a cell. In this case, the green uh, particles are highly concentrated outside of the cell, so they will do facilitated diffusion through this channel protein. Uh, in this case, we have a carrier protein, which is also allowing particles to move um, into the cell from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Active transport is when materials are moved into or out of cells requiring the use of energy by the cell. Remember that the source of energy for cells is going to be ATP. Some examples of active transport include endocytosis, exocytosis, and the sodium-potassium pump. This is an illustration of the sodium-potassium pump important for the functioning of neurons. So here we see the extracellular space. This is outside of the nerve cell. Here is the intracellular space. This is inside of the neuron. Uh, we can see the cell membrane, the phospholipid bilayer, and there is a membrane protein that's involved in this process. We can see that the concentration of sodiums, shown in orange here, is uh, that they are highly concentrated outside of the cell. The sodiums on the inside of the cell are a lower concentration. So to move them out of the cell means we're moving them against the concentration gradient. So when the sodiums move into this membrane protein, the use of energy from an ATP molecule breaking off this P leaves an ADP right here. The use of that energy pushes those sodiums to outside of the cell where they are more highly concentrated. Then potassiums, which are less uh, lower concentration outside of the cell, can move through that same membrane protein and move into the cell, where they are also more highly concentrated. This slide shows the process of endocytosis. This process moves materials into cells through a process of engulfment. So here we're seeing a picture of a cell um, this would be a, a macrophage cell, which is part of the immune system. We can see that the cell membrane is actually going to move around and engulf bacterial cells here, and that will move those into um, vesicles, which can later be um, where the uh, bacterial cells can be broken down. Uh, my students would, should remember watching the in-class video of the amoeba cell, which fed by this same process. Let's take a quick look at the um, breakdown of this vocabulary term. Cyte, C-Y-T, refers to cell. Endo means in. So endocytosis means movement of materials into a cell. This slide looks at the process of exocytosis. Again, cyte refers to cell. Exo refers to exiting. So this is basically the reverse of endocytosis. This is moving materials from inside of a cell to pushing them to be outside of the cell. So at the top of the image here, we're extracellular fluid outside of the cell. Here we're at the inside of the cell. This is a secretory vesicle which is holding materials which should be removed from the cell. So the vesicle can actually fuse with the cell membrane, the phospholipid bilayer, and then the membrane can actually open up so that those materials can be pushed out of the cell. This same process is used uh, for synaptic transmission of nerve impulses, and uh, my students will learn more about that by completing an online lesson, looking at the conduction of nervous signals and then how um, signals are sent from one neuron to another at the synaptic cleft.